Welcome to Garden Success with Skip Richter, the show designed to help you have a bountiful garden and a beautiful landscape. Call in now with your lawn and garden questions at 979-845-5689 or email your questions to gardensuccess at tamu.edu. And now, retired Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist, Skip Richter. Well, hello and welcome to Garden Success. We are glad you're with us today. Uh, This is a call-in show, so how about I give you a phone number so you can call in with any kind of gardening questions you might have. We can help with identifying problems, identifying plants even, Uh, and you can reach us at 979-845-5689, 979-845-5689, or by email at gardensuccess at T-A-M-U dot E-D-U, garden success at T-A-M-U dot E-D-U. That's nice. I say we can help with problems and identifying plants. We can also advise, what do you plant this time of year? Uh, what would I suggest? I got a question the other day about turf grasses and recommending, you know, what's the best turf grass and stuff for the area. By the way, there's there's no such thing as best uh, turf grass or best plant in many cases. There's a lot of options, and that's kind of one of the nice things we enjoy about uh, gardening is that we can, you know, be able to um, try different things out, experiment with different things, find out what's going to go best, what's going to do best for us. Uh, so let's go straight to the emails for right now while we wait on you guys to give us a call. And again, the number, 845-5689. I had a question from Roger about a oak tree that's about 40 years old and the bark started uh, separating right after the last freeze this year. What's wrong? What's the prognosis? And so on. How do we deal with it? Stuff like that. Well, uh, as we take a look uh, at the tree and the issue, uh, there's huge sections of bark just popping off the tree. I don't see the characteristics of oak um, hypoxylon canker on the, in the particular picture uh, that Ryder sent, but there's a whole section of bark missing. Whenever I get a question like this, what I usually ask is, is that on the southwest side of the tree? On the southwest side of the tree, the summer sun shines warmest at the end of the end of the day. So imagine the uh, winter, I said summer sun, winter sun. Imagine that the uh, sun is traveling in a lower arc across the sky. In other words, not directly overhead east-west, but more kind of partway toward the south. When that happens, the warmest part of the day is about, mm, what, 3 or 4 o'clock, something like that. And when you hit that point of the day, the sun is in the southwest sky. It shines on the tissues of the trunk, and an otherwise dormant tree those tissues, let's just say, start to kind of come awake. Uh, They come out of dormancy, if you will. And the sap begins to flow. They lose their cold hardiness as a result of that. Then that evening, we get this really hard freeze, and it kills those tissues on that side of the trunk. Normally, we see this on very young trees. Uh, Because as the bark gets thicker and thicker, uh, it becomes you know, more of an insulator, I guess. It doesn't heat up the interior living tissues as much with all that dead outer bark out there. So we don't see it as much on the older trees, but we still, we still can see that. And I think that's probably what's going on if it's on the southwest side of the tree. If not, I don't know of any mechanism that would cause that big section of bark to just suddenly die off. I can't really tell from the pictures. Uh, By the way, folks, if you will send me pictures uh, as uh, attachments, which which Roger did, thank you very much, uh, it's easier for me to zoom in and take a really, really close look uh, at some of the tissues, especially when it's in good sharp focus. And in, in grabbing a hold of these pictures and looking closer, I see evidence of some borer damage. Now there's different kinds of borers. There's the type that that uh, are part of killing the tree. They tunnel through the living tissues. That would be like pine bark beetles and, and various borers that attack pretty much every species of tree. Uh, and they tunnel along, let's just say, uh, in 
in the same plane as the bark is going. In other words, like a cylinder around the tree. There are other borers that will drill into the tree, uh, and they may go into a tree that's already dead and, and drill into the interior wood uh, to do their, set up their home there for, the, for that part of the life cycle. Uh, here I see the first kind, which would kill bark. Now that could be the tree was stressed for some reason. I don't see a lot of uh, exit holes uh, or entry holes for that matter. Uh, in the particular photo that I see. But bottom line is there were borers involved in this one. So it may have been a combination of cold and borers or just for some reason the borers took off and went after that particular particular tree. Generally speaking, a healthy tree is not as susceptible to issues like insect and disease problems as a weakened tree. Each insect and disease, though, presents exceptions to that rule. Uh, and so we just have to kind of generalize in saying that. So bottom line, uh, I think, Roger, in your, in your case, is just be aware that uh, if it's on the southwest side, I think cold injury was involved. But we did have some borers that either moved in early uh, and helped finish that off or that were actually part of the problem from the beginning. Uh, now, what do we do when we have borers in a tree? There's not a lot you can do. Uh, there's not insecticides, certainly, that soak in through the bark. Systemic products, they, they can be somewhat helpful depending on what we're going after, but oftentimes they're not. And without going into the nerdy details, uh, there are different kinds of tissues that go up in the tree and down in the tree, and the borers primarily are feeding in the uh, outer tissues, the phloem. Uh, that are doing the damage I see here, and so the, it's hard to get the product to them. Keeping the tree as healthy as you can. Get all the loose bark off. If the tree is healthy, it should be able to begin to um, uh, wall off the area that was wounded and begin to put a uh, callus tissue over from the sides. You probably have seen this where you cut a branch off. And after a year or two, you're starting to see this slow movement as if a lava flow was coming in from all sides that ends up closing off the wound. We inaccurately say the tree is healing, uh, but that what's really happening is it's just closing off that exposed interior wood space, which is good uh, for long-term structural integrity of that tree. Anyway, there's, there's some thoughts on that one. Our phone number is 979-845-5689, 979-845-5689. A question came in from Cindy with a question about a new weed that's out in the yard. I want to know, is it, um, let's see, now I can't get the thing to go back. I have to reopen it here. Sorry about that. Okay, there. Uh, it looks like uh, poison ivy or parsley or some poison hemlock, excuse me, or parsley. I don't think it's poison hemlock. Uh, there are a number of weeds that have that kind of leaf. Uh, anything in the carrot family, you know, Queen Anne's lace and carrots and uh, all of that kind of group of plants can have that kind of leaves. We have a number of yard weeds that have that kind of leaves. Uh, so I would just uh, say if it's in, it says yard. So if it's in your grass, you can treat it with a broadleaf weed control product. I would do that now, right away, uh, because as the weather heats up and our we start to get up in the mid to upper 80s, uh, certainly the 90s, the products that work best killing broadleaf weeds also take a toll on St. Augustine lawns, as an example. And so we, we like to avoid that. So go ahead and get that work done now uh, with the spraying if you're going to do it. And uh, I think that's probably your best bet. There are a number of products out there on the market that do well. I'm not going to get into all the different brand names. Go somewhere that, that where they, A, know what they're talking about. In other words, they, they specialize in the things they sell to control insect pests and diseases. I'll just leave you with that one. You can figure it out from there. Uh, and uh, ask them for a broadleaf post-emergent weed killer that is uh, labeled for use on St. Augustine lawns. If their eyes glaze over partway into that request, uh, turn around and go somewhere else uh, because there are a lot of places that sell chemicals but have no idea what they're selling. And I walk a little bit of a careful line here, but I, it, it is very alarming to me um, to make recommendations of chemicals 
to people that don't read the label and may not know how to use them. And I'm not saying that in a snobby way. I'm just saying I witness all the time. If a teaspoon is good, a tablespoon is better. And the answer is absolutely not. You overdose a herbicide and you can cause all kinds of problems. You can cause your grass to not root in with certain pre-emergent herbicides that prevents the weeds. Uh, you overdo those and your grass, St. Augustine's running out there trying to put roots down and it can't. I see that a lot and that should not happen. I talked to someone once trying to figure out why is it so bad? Why is the club rooting so bad in your yard? And come to find out, uh, he had a landscaper who, who treated his yard. He fired him. He got a new one. They immediately treated the yard. He got rid of them and then he did it himself and did it again. <laughs> All right, well, that's my point. Uh, you got to be careful with that. That is true with broadleaf herbicides. There are broadleaf control herbicides that really stress the grass. And when you wait until it's summer and it's hot and you spray it in the hot part of the day uh, and then you overdo it, you just open the door to everything from death of the lawn to increase in certain diseases like take all root rot, which kills the lawn. So uh, that's my little soapbox tirade. Read the label. If it's not on the label, it's not legal to be recommended or used on that particular plant. Something may be labeled for one kind of turf grass, but not for another. There's a reason for that. If you were making a herbicide, why not make it for all the turf species so you can make more money selling more of it? Well, there's a reason. Some things you can use on Bermuda that you can't use on St. Augustine. And there are other, many other examples of such a thing. So be really careful. Sorry, Cindy, that was not directed at you. That was directed at, uh, I don't know, a lot of people I've encountered over 36 years doing this uh, that uh, then later uh, I come back and see the problem. Uh, just a fun, fun story. Uh, one time I was uh, visiting a yard where a guy said, half my trees turned yellow. And I think, okay trees don't turn half yellow. What's going on? We went out there and you could draw a line through that tree, almost through the middle of the tree actually. Left side green, right side very sick. I mean yellow meaning really yellow, yellow looking leaves. Uh, and I asked him what had happened. Well, he had used a certain ingredient of pre-emergent herbicide in his lawn, went all the way across the lawn at the proper rate, still had some left over. Well, why not put a little more out and kill the weeds even more? Came back across the yard and he ran out right underneath that tree halfway through. That night he got a gully washer rain, moves it down in the root system. And I'm telling you, I wish I'd had my camera that day because that was like just a poster example of why we don't do these kind of things. So, all right, I'll quit on that one. But uh, broadly, if we control, get it done soon, uh, Cindy, and uh, I think you'll have much, much better result. Uh, if you go to a place that knows what they're talking about, they're going to be able to point you to the right product and even talk to you about how to use it. Uh, a lot of places, they sell stuff, but they sell a lot of other things in addition to lawn and garden even. And, and so you end up then not necessarily having somebody that knows what they're talking about. And the rest is history, uh, as they say, on issues that, that can pop up in people's lawns. Our phone number is 979-845-5689, 979-845-5689. If you'd like to give us a call, what kind of gardening questions do you have? What could we be helping you with? Uh, also, uh, if you would like to email, it's gardensuccess at tamu.edu, gardensuccess at tamu.edu. Make sure and attach the photo rather than embed it. It allows me to zoom in better and faster, and it just, it's easier for me to handle and assess the photo. And we want to get you a good, quick answer that is also accurate. <laughs> uh, it is also accurate. So uh, I had an email come in from Tad, uh, and Tad has something that is uh, on uh, the, um, uh, that's the, on his property a little bit south of campus, the uh, a whole line of liriopes was dug up. Then there's a line of holes uh, in the leaves next. Uh, there's just a lot of things going on. He puts a bunch of photos in here, and I'll kind of describe uh, some of these out to you as we, as we go through them. Uh, I see little 
you know, images where things have kind of tunneled around, dug around, and whatnot, and it's real hard to tell a tad from those photos just exactly what we're dealing with. It could be something like an armadillo going along, pushing his snoot in the ground a little bit, checking for some grubs, or maybe he smelled and is eating a grub. That is kind of common because it's not a real clear, distinct hole. I can't tell you exactly what it is. You'd almost have to have a wild game camera out there to catch them. But that's what it looks like. Could also be a skunk that is coming along and doing a little bit of, you know, real shallow digging, just finding things that like the same sort of things out there. Uh, that is a possibility uh, as to the fact that it's doing it around some of your looser dirt and plants. Well, I just, I just can't tell you for sure on this one. I'm not a wildlife damage expert, but it is going to be one of those kinds of creatures. I'd probably put about 80% confidence in skunk or armadillo in this particular case. Uh, but there could be some other things involved. So what do you do? There's there's not much you can do. Um, you can, you've tried the controlling grubs, which theoretically helps some. Uh, what what I would say is with the, with the grubs, just remember that something that's going along after grubs is also going along after earthworms. In all these settings, it's a nice mulch, earthy setting with decomposing organic matter. You're going to have things out there like worms, and so just the grub control pe uh, treatment alone is not helpful. The um, the non-labeled, you know, kind of home remedy things, I'd, no, no comment on those. I don't expect those to be helpful uh, for you at all. Uh, so the only other thing would be a live trap. And if it were an armadillo, there are ways to use a trap like that for armadillo. You almost have to funnel the bumbling little creatures into it. Uh, two boards going out from the entrance to the trap in the shape of a big giant V. Uh, and so they come bumbling along. Typically, you'll find them going along a fence line or things. Not, not at all, always. But And so you have to set your trap up like that. If you go to... I believe the Texas Wildlife Damage Management Service had some uh, publications that were very, very helpful uh, for that sort of thing. And I'm going to see if I can can look here and, and find that uh, for you. Uh, it, it may be on AgriLife Learn. That would be my first suggestion is go to agrilifelearn.tamu.edu, agrilifelearn. Uh, excuse me, learn. Can't type and talk at the same time. <laughs> All right. Anyway, uh, if you go to agrilifelearn.tamu.edu, that is where all the AgriLife publications are. And there are publications, by the way, if you, this is way outside the question, but you need to know this. If, if you have questions about canning food, if you have questions about 4-H and, and uh, agriculture and farms and ranches and home, uh, certainly the home and garden uh, and critters and all of that. You can find it on AgriLife Learn. Most of the publications are free. It's really easy, easy to do. Um, so you just go there and you, you type in. Uh, in the case that we're doing right here, I, did, I typed in armadillo damage. It has uh, a, a for sale publication for a dollar and then a free publication that you just add it to your cart, you download it, and it tells you all about them. You could do that for other issues, other critter, critters like roof rats and skunks and, and other things, or anything else, including all the, all the gardening questions that, uh, that you might have. So you may want to check that out and get a little more advice there uh, from people who know a heck of a lot more about dealing with wildlife uh, than I do. Uh, let's see, where are we now? Well, let me give you a phone number again, 979-845-5689. You know, we had a day where the phones just rang off the hooks, and it's spring, and I thought, oh, that makes sense. Then we had another day where the phones didn't ring off the hooks. And I don't know if you're out in the garden working or whatnot, but uh, we, are, <laughs> we are happy to help if you need something. Uh, had a another question came in from Tad. Um, uh, let's see here. I've got a couple of questions, if I can pull them up uh, right quick. Uh, he had uh, was looking for palms, um, but uh, kind of wondering if, if there's any hope in finding a good, tough, protected palm, uh, from a, per, a palm that is protected from cold, or if there's something you can do. Well, most palm trees are going to get larger, so a, a building protecting them against north winds is is not going to help a lot. And on a cold, cold, still night, it's still going to be 
it's, or windy night, either one, it, there's still going to be a lot of air movement around and not do so well. Uh, now, the sable minor is a, is a good palm. That, that is the uh, palmetto. And then there's the needle palm, uh, windmill palms. Those are very, very cold palms. But I think one of the best palms that I've seen uh, is, is called um, uh, Texas sable palm. It's, a, it's, a, it's not like a, a short little palmetto. It's a regular size palm tree, uh, but it, it does amazingly, amazingly well. And he sent me some pictures of it, and I, if those are still, yep, those are still alive. I know where those are. Uh, those are probably Texas sable palms, uh, uh, sable Texana. There's also a sable Mexicana. Uh, that's a similar, very similar looking palm, and those are very hardy. Uh, back when we went through seven degrees in College Station, maybe a little variation where you live, but about seven degrees, that was uh, February 21, uh, I saw palms just get killed all over the place, and the Texas or Mexican sables seem to be just fine, including the ones you sent in the picture. That's what those are. So if you want a big, palm tree looking palm tree <laughs> that would be the one needle palm is much shorter it's mul there's multi trunk palms by the way needle palm uh, you need to remember you need to realize that word needle is in there for a very good reason very sharp sharp spines uh, like needles uh, and uh, a little bit of a, a challenge sometimes to get in and try to do any kind of work around uh, that would almost be like petting a porcupine to try to prune <laughs> a needle palm that's been my experience with them at least. Okay, our phone number is 979-845-5689, 979-845-5689. had a question come in. Let's see here. This one is from Mindy, uh, and Mindy planted a trumpet vine, a honeysuckle, against the back fence over 20 years ago. In the past few years, both have crept all the way to my front flower beds. The trumpet vine especially has been hard, later, hard to remove. Uh, it keeps sprouting. You know, you remove it, and here comes one here and there and the other. Uh, I pull them up, and nothing seems to work. Uh, and I'm just uh, looking here through the options and things. So pretty much any kind of, you know, home remedies are really popular because they seem easy. Uh, they seem inexpensive, maybe, uh, and and it's all over social media, that kind of thing. Don't Don't believe most of those. Most of them aren't true. Vinegar. All vinegar does is burn the living tissues of a weed if it's strong enough vinegar. Household vinegar is about 5%. It will make weeds look bad, but not flat kill them. Uh, and, but 10% uh, vinegar is getting strong enough, and then they even have it 20 and 30, which to me, if you're looking for safety, I cannot imagine a worse thing to splash in your eye uh, than 20 or 30% uh, vinegar. But anyway... Uh, they burn the top of weeds. And so when you have something that is perennial, that can pop back up from the ground like nutsedge or Bermuda grass, or in this case, trumpet vines and, and uh, what was the other? Oh, honeysuckle. Yeah, that they absolutely uh, of no benefit at all to those. Um, now, she also had some um, uh, Mexican petunias that uh, have become aggressive, which they do. Mexican petunia, you see those as the little clumps that have either blue or pink flowers or white flowers, very typically. There's also upright types that typically are bluish purple. Maybe they get almost waist high. Uh, and then there's one type that is pink. And they all cast seed far and wide, and the seeds pop up everywhere. So the either either you kind of just accept the fact that you're going to be weeding them out all the time, or you go with a different plant, or you put them in a bed where it's nothing but them, and then it doesn't matter if they cast their own seed around, around the plants. But back to what do we do? Anytime we're dealing with a especially a woody type plant, but a very persistent, difficult plant, uh, especially woody and shrubby and viney, putting a product that contains triclopyr on those plants is, is an effective control. Now, if, if you've got a very extensive plant, uh, the trumpet vine, for example, I mean, it is going everywhere. It's coming up everywhere. You're not going to just treat it once and it's gone. You're going to have to come back uh, because you're not going to get it all the first time. Uh, but triclopyr is a woody weed control product. 
on a farm and ranch, the ingredient uh, is called by something named Remedy. There are probably other products. That's not my world either, farm and ranch. But uh, Remedy is an example fr that a rancher might use to control brush in a pasture. Uh, but uh, Triclopyr has home labels. You can go to a garden center and buy it. Uh, in that setting, it'll be called brush control or poison ivy control. Uh, it'll have names like that. But the ingredient, this is the important thing. Forget the common name. Triclopyr, P-Y-R, Triclopyr. Now, that will damage any broadleaf plant that you put it on. So if you use it in flower beds and just spray it, it's going to kill a lot of things. If you spray it in your lawn, it is too hard on, on your lawn. Uh, the, our St. Augustine grass especially cannot, cannot take it. So what I would recommend doing is one of two things. Either cut the thing off at the ground, above the ground, like the little stump, and this would be true if it was poison ivy, it would be true if it's your honey, or you're a trumpet vine, or if it is hackberry coming up in a fence line. Cut it off above the ground and immediately dab triclopyr right on that cut stump. Immediately, not the next day. You dab it, just, I use a little foam brush because it's easy to handle, and you can throw it away when you're done, uh, and just get a little triclopyr on it and dab it right on that stump, and it'll translocate down. Uh, sometimes with smaller plants that there's a lot of vine kind of to them and, and it's not as woody, uh, didn't have a thick bark on it, uh, I, can ev I, I will even use like a weed eater, not to cut it off, but just to kind of wound that outer area a little bit and then just wipe that on the, on the uh, exposed branches. Pepper vine, there's another one that we deal with, is very invasive and uh, Trichopyr works on it. Just remember, it may take more than once. So that's kind of my go-to when I'm dealing with things you don't want. Uh, if, you, if you're going to do foliage treatments, just make sure, that do it, be very careful. There's no wind to blow it onto a desirable plant nearby. Uh, so that means don't pump up your sprayer to where it's putting out a fine mist that floats around. Uh, and uh, that would be pretty much the end of the instructions on that, Mindy, but uh, I think I think that's going to be the way you have to go about going going after these things. I've never used triclopyr on the um, Mexican petunia, um, so I, I can't say for sure that it would work on that. Uh, something else that I've done is, and you can, you can do this homemade yourself, you know little tools that you use to grab a jar off a shelf? They're a little, about three feet long. They got a little pistol grip on one end and suction cups or, or something to grab on the other end. And it's just like a, a, you reach up and you squeeze it and it grabs onto stuff. I've taken those and depending on how much of a do-it-yourself where you are, you kind of have to figure out how to get from here to there. But I put a, a little metal plate uh, and then um, uh, foam sponges on, on those so that it squeezed two sponges together. It takes a little washer and a, a bolt to go through them. Some are designed for that, by the way. Uh, they, they have a bolt already in them holding on the suction cup. And you do that, and then you wet the sponge with whatever you want to use. You could use it with glyphosate, which, which Roundup is an example brand. You could use it with a grass-only killer. You could use it with triclopyr. Uh, and you just dampen the sponge with that solution, and then you wipe it on the leaves. Now, with the stump cuts, we're using pretty much the solution just about straight on there because we're just dabbing a little teaspoon onto the stump cut uh, on these small things. But on the other, you just wipe it on leaves. Squeeze it on the leaf and kind of pull it up to wipe it onto the leaves. And you can go in among, like one of your pictures is next to an amaryllis there. You could get in there and get on that weed without getting it on your amaryllis. You could uh, you could reach under a rose bush and get it on something underneath there. Uh, so that little tool works pretty good. It's a homemade do-it-yourself deal. All right, well, that is, I think that's that on that one. I don't know if there's much else to say about it. A lot of people, some of these questions I go into more detail or a broader question than you asked, but I think other people, pretty much everybody listening probably can think outside to where they have some vines coming up in the shrubs they don't want or... Uh, maybe the birds have planted uh, poison ivy or planted hackberry or something in the in the fence lines and trying to get rid of it. Uh, and when you're not a farmer rancher, access to all those kind of things, uh, this is a way you can do it in the backyard and have pretty good results. 
Our phone number is 979-845-5689. 979-845-5689. So whatever you're looking to accomplish today, I suggest that uh, you can give us a call. We'll discuss those kind of things. I just uh, I have completed all my grass planting, finally, uh, and gotten all that watered in. That was a multi-week ordeal, but... That. I won't bore you with the details, but we got it all done. So I've got grass now, uh, and that's that's a good thing. Again, uh, tell you one thing: uh, those of you who went through last year know the uh, fact that uh, when it's hot and when it's dry, <laughs> there is um, there is a lot of issues that happen to our grass, right? Uh, and as, as a result, you need to make sure your irrigation system is working well. And I would I would suggest that you just go ahead and have it professionally audited. Now, if you don't want to go that route, you can do a do-it-yourself evaluation that is much less thorough and accurate than a, than a true audit. Uh, but in evaluating it, you would do things like turn it on. Make sure all the heads are popping up. Make sure they're spraying the parts of your lawn with grass and not the driveway and the street. And you get the idea. Uh, make sure that the overlap between heads is adequate. You know, ideally, you would like the water from one sprinkler head to land at the base of the other sprinkler head where it comes out of the ground. That way, that overlap, you, you would think, well, am I, not, am I going to overwater? Well, no, you don't run it as long. But uh, that gives you an even coverage, a more even coverage. Most systems are very inefficient. Some areas barely get enough water to keep the grass alive. Other areas end up getting overwatered because you're trying to keep the grass alive where the coverage isn't reaching as well. So you can do that kind of audit, or I should use the term evaluation yourself. You can put out rain gauges all over the yard or use straight-sided cans like a tuna fish can, a cat food can, even a bean, you know, pinto bean can or whatever. Just a straight-sided can, and now you've got a little rain gauge, and you set it out in the yard, put a bunch of them out and then run the water for whatever amount of time, uh, probably about at least 15 minutes, uh, so you can get a more accurate assessment, and then go around looking at the amount of water in the cans. One can may hardly have the base of the can fully wet. Another one may have half inch of water in it. That's what I'm talking about, it even, even as a distribution. But now's the time to get that fixed, because we are... Uh, about to enter the time when we're running those things a lot. And so making your system more efficient is really important. You know, when you pay for water, uh, you, there's such a thing as a sewer bill that is often affected, depending on the community that you live in, the water supply. Uh, there's also the fact that it's drinking water. You're putting drinking water on your plants. So that's water that, uh, you know, it comes at a cost. I mean, it, it's, been, it's been processed to make it a... I use the term process, probably not the right word, but to make it suitable for us to drink. And uh, so when we have to use that on our lawns, uh, we sure don't want to waste it. Again, comes at a cost. So just something to think about there. Now is a good time to make sure that's all done. If you've got any areas of your lawn that are thin or, or that are just dead, uh, a, a rule of thumb that I would use is you know, if it's about a foot between living grass areas, like you got a sprig or a little four-inch clump over here that's alive and then a foot away, another one, well, that'll close over by about midsummer with good care as long as the grass is healthy. Uh, and so I wouldn't worry about that. When you start getting, you know, like now i got three feet between spots, you need to plug something in there. You can put a whole piece of sod in. You can take a piece of sod and chop it into three or four sections and put those in. That way a little piece of sod goes further if you're trying to save a few bucks. Uh, it does take the extra labor though, of course. That's always a trade-off, labor and money. Uh, but if you want to fill those areas in now and start taking good care of them, uh, we're going to be fertilizing pretty soon here. You can fertilize now. Generally, I recommend people fertilizing for the summertime once you've mowed the lawn twice. So if you've mowed it twice, it is actively growing, and you know you're going to get real good efficient use of it. Fertilizing earlier is fine, but the earlier and earlier you get, the less 
of that product uh, is probably going to be around when the grass is most actively growing. Uh, and so that, that's one reason why I like to use the when you've mowed it twice as a general guide. I know people are anxious to do it earlier. When you, mo when you fertilize earlier, you're going to get a little bit of a green up. The grass is going to take up the nutrients. You're going to see the benefit to the grass. But it is temperature, not lack of nutrient, that causes our grasses to not want to get growing in the spring. They're, they're slow. They wake. I like to say that our, our St. Augustine lawns wait, uh, sleep as late as a teenager on Saturday morning after. Uh, my apologies to all teenagers out there, but you know what I'm saying. They, they kind of wake up a little bit slow. And so uh, to get the most out of your landscape, fertilizing dollar, fertilize when you mowed twice. Fertilizing earlier is fine if you want. If you go to the Brazos County Master Gardeners website, and you go to their Central Texas Gardening and the Edible Gardening. By the way, there's a lot of good information there on the site. Uh, if you scroll down, what you're going to see is under Edible Gardening, there's a vegetable planting dates in Brazos County. It's the second link down the page. And if you click on that, you get this nice chart that is a checkerboard of green. I put it together a number of years ago. In fact, I originally did this uh, in, in another county. Uh, and, and then just redid it for up here. Uh, but it tells you what to plant when. So here we are right now. We are in the middle. We're going to say we're in the middle of April. And looking at that, it's saying, hey, you need to get your, your green beans planted. Uh, the best time to plant them, I said, ends in the middle of April, but you can plant them all through April. Uh, so you know how nature is. It's not black and white lines. So uh, we start planting beans at the beginning of March. We, we try to end them by the 1st of May. The best time, we're, we're in the peak time right now still, but don't delay. Time to get those in. If you got uh, uh, lima beans, which in the south we call butter beans, and if you're from the south, we say butter beans. See, there's three different words for that same vegetable. Uh, this is a time to plant those as well. Uh, you can still plant things like chard. That's a that's a green that it, it's it's a really cool green. It's not freeze tolerant, but it it takes cool weather, uh, but it also takes heat uh, really well, amazingly well. Now is prime time for getting that corn planted. Uh, so do you you know do you want to grow regular sweet corn or do you want to try one of the super sweet types of corn? There's actually more than just two types of sweet corn uh, that that you can plant and then many varieties of each type. Now's the time to do that. Cucumbers, big time to plant cucumbers. Eggplant, we can get those planted now. And melons, if you've never grown your own melons, you should try that. Uh, watermelons, cantaloupe or musk melon, which are actually two different things. Uh, those honeydew melons you can grow as well. Uh, I like growing my own cantaloupes. And uh, if you've got a sunny spot, you can grow a really nice sweet cantaloupe. Just know this, that the day before you are planning on going out and picking it, the varmints will come in that night. That is true. Sweet corn as well. They have clairvoyance. I think they put their ears to the windows of your house and listen to you talk. Say, you know, hon, I'm going to go pick sweet corn tomorrow morning. And that, that's their cue. The word gets out and all the varmints in the neighborhood attack your sweet corn patch. I can t I'm joking, but I can tell you this. It's happened to me more than twice that the day before I was going out there. They hit it. They hit the thing. So I, that's my uh, paranoid uh, assessment of why that happens. Uh, okra. It is time to plant okra. Hallelujah. Okra season. If you've never grown okra before, you need to try. Now, if you're one of those people right now whining at the radio going, it is slimy. Well, first of all, let me correct you. We do not call okra slimy. We call it mucilaginous. That's a proper term. Plus, it sounds better. Um, mucilaginous. You got to try it. If you don't like the mucilage, uh, first of all, you should embrace it. And here's why: okra has two different kinds of fiber in it, and and this is true of other some other plants as well. But okra has a insoluble fiber that's very good for your colon, your intestinal system, your dietary intestinal tract health. Then it has another kind of fiber that's soluble that's very good for heart health. Uh, and the mucilage is uh, primarily part of that soluble fiber. Uh, and it helps thicken soups. It, that makes gumbo thicker. Uh, and so, you know, who needs cornstarch when you have okra mucilage? Well, you can thicken things up with okra, too. It's good for you, uh, and I think it tastes good. Now, I grew up eating it fried, 
and that is not the healthiest form healthiest form of any food, but it tastes good. Uh, a lot of you go to places to get fried chicken and you get the mashed potatoes and fried okra, right? Okay, well, you can do it that way if you want. Uh, we like to cook it at our house on the grill. So anytime we're going out to barbecue chicken or meat or if we're going to go out and grill a burger, okra goes on the grill too. And it's real simple. You pick little pods of it, you brush them with olive oil, sprinkle them with sea salt, and put them two minutes on one side, flip them over two minutes on the other side, you're done. And when you eat that, it will not be slimy. I mean, it's got almost none that you're, ta you're getting in there. It's very, very good. Uh, so there you go. It makes lots of, lots of different things that you can do from okra. I could sit here and do a whole show on okra. Those of you who know me or roll, started rolling your eyes, eyes when I said okra the first time because you knew it was coming. But it is good. It is a wonderful vegetable. We ought to grow more of it, and there are great ways uh, to use it and even to take advantage of the mucilaginous. Remember, you will no longer ever use the word slime when you talk about okra. Uh, the mucilaginous quality. A lot of, uh, we have other vegetables that have that mucilage uh, as well, and especially when it comes to summer greens. Some of the hot weather summer greens uh, have that mucilage in them also. All right, enough about okra, although I'd really like to keep talking about it. Uh, southern peas. Do you like purple hull? Do you like black eyes? Do you like uh, let's see, um, Crowder. I just went blank on southern peas. Crowder, zipper cream peas. Those are all examples of southern peas. Pink eye, pink eye purple hull. Uh, A&M has even released a number of different southern peas in the breeding program here. And they're great. I love growing southern peas. Nothing tastes the same. You know how we say in our gardens, when you eat something, if you grew it yourself, it tastes better. And sometimes we go, yeah, well, that's because you grew it yourself, you know. But no, when it comes to southern peas, there are few foods that taste that much better when you grow them yourself as if you buy them like in a can, for example. Uh, it destroy. If you grew up eating canned black-eyed peas, I want to tell you about a completely different vegetable. Let's just say it's completely unrelated, although it's not. Uh, if when you grow fresh-shelled southern peas, oh my gosh, it is night and day. If you want to test it out, go find a quality frozen southern pea, and you can get close there uh, on on the quality of it. But you got to grow some yourself. Pretty cool. Peppers. Still time to plant pepper transplants. Uh, if you are going to plant sweet potatoes, we are now in sweet potato planting season. Maybe a little hard to find. I haven't checked the garden centers lately. Uh, on those, but uh, they'll start coming in if they're not already pretty soon here. But you can plant them this early. It's a little bit early, but you can plant them this early. Uh, potatoes, uh, sweet, excuse me, sweet potato uh, sl slips, uh, pumpkins, and winter squashes, and summer squashes. Those can all be planted now. We're in the big middle of planting all the summer squashes. So what's the difference between summer and winter squash? Summer squash grows uh, in the warm season, the growing season, we say here, winter squash grows in the growing season. Summer squash, we pick immature, and so therefore it's ready to eat from planting, you know, much sooner. It may be hmm, 60 days, 50 days, somewhere in that range, depending on which kind you plant. Probably less, well, less than 60, typically, for it. Uh, and then winter squashes may be 90, 100, 120 days. Uh, it just depends on what kind you're planting there uh, before they're ready. We eat those at the mature stage. So those can all be planted now. Tomatoes, okay, last call. This is it. Uh, get those tomatoes planted ASAP because summer's coming. They don't set fruit in the heat, especially the slicer types. So you don't want to do that. And then finally, warm season greens. I will talk about those on another day because that's a whole nother subject. Uh, to plant. If you're going to do the cantaloupes and watermelons, you can find cultivars that are a little more compact. I would highly recommend you trellis, especially the cantaloupes. Uh, that way they don't take up as much space on the on the garden spot. If you don't have a big garden area, you can go vertical on a fence with them. Just provide some support. Know that when they get ripe, true muskmelons are going to snap off and fall to the ground. 
from their own weight. So watch out for that. So anyway, well, I was telling you about this um, really cool uh, chart that's online. If you're interested and you would like to check it out, you just go to BrazosMG.com. BrazosMG.com. The AgriLife Extension Master Gardener Volunteer Program, uh, including the ones here in the volunteers here in uh, Brazos County is a wonderful program, creates volunteers, trains volunteers, and actively uh, involves volunteers. They're doing all kinds of things around the community. So your little um, change, handful of change that you throw into the Extension County uh, programs around the state of Texas, uh, those really reap great benefits, including the fact that you get additional volunteers. Here in, in Brazos County, the volunteer hours of the, vol of the volunteers exceed by many times the number of hours that uh, the hired personnel are putting on at the office. So it's a great multiplication for those of you who like to get more for your money. Excellent, excellent program for that. And I would consider myself someone who would like to get more for the money. Our phone number is 979-845- Five six eight nine nine seven nine eight four five fifty six eighty nine. I've got about ten minutes left in the show today. If you'd like to give us a call, be happy to do that. We're here every Thursday from twelve noon to one p.m. Uh, I want to remind you too that you can listen to Garden Success online. You can listen to it live on the radio at the KAMU FM website. Uh, you can also. Uh, what do you subscribe to the podcast? Uh, depending on your podcast provider, uh, just do a search for Garden Success. And uh, I guess there's probably some other Garden Success in the nation somewhere, but uh, find the one for us here. And you subscribe, and that way each past show is posted, and so you can listen to past shows as well. I think you may be able to listen to them live on the, on the podcast. No, not live, just uh, just from the past shows. Okay. No, the past shows are on the podcast, and uh, they just search for Garden Success with Skip Richter. With Skip Richter. Okay. And within the last week or two, I uploaded the episodes that aired during the holiday break. So oh, all good. of those are available if anybody happened to miss those or wanted to re-listen to them. That's wonderful. Uh, uh, people have been asking about that because we played some really good at past interviews uh, during the break when I was away from the mic. And uh, that those shows are well worth listening to. We, you know, we have such a wealth of uh, people here in the community for entomologists and plant pathologists and soil scientists and horticulturists and, and just on and on. It, it, it makes for a really nice uh, guest show uh, episode. So I'd encourage you to go back and, and listen to those as well. Uh, let's see, I was going to, what was I talking about earlier? Uh, about the lawns. Uh, it's something that was in my brain a moment ago. Oh, I know what it was. Uh, if you have any pruning that you need to do and you didn't get done this, this winter, go ahead and do it ASAP. Uh, the fastest time for wound healing is in the spring, and here we are, right in the big middle of it. So if you get those cuts done soon, they'll begin their healing uh, right away. And it, we don't normally want to wait until now to do pruning, but you can. There's not a problem with that. So if you've got issues with your tree branch angles or a branch growing where you don't want it, don't wait until next winter. Uh, because it'll just be a bigger branch, a bigger cut, a bigger wound, and more of the energy put into that branch. It's now going to be cut off and thrown away. Uh, so go ahead and get the final, uh, if you can make it final, pruning done this year. You can prune any sum, any month of the year. We just try to mainly focus on that season. Let's go to the phones now. We're going to talk to Colleen. Hello, Colleen. Hello. Good afternoon. Um if you have discussed this previously, I'm sorry, I haven't been able to listen for a while, but could you please discuss what is going on with all the juniper trees that oh I see dead out yeah. in the landscape? And what's puzzling is that there'll be a dead one, and then there'll be a very healthy-looking one yeah. pretty close to it. Yeah. So, uh, I, I saw something recently. Dr. Ong, uh, who is the head of the uh, state plant clinic here at Texas A&M, uh, Dr. Kevin Ong, uh, he he puts out a lot of information, you know, both from the plant lab and some of his um, 
his group there uh, put stuff online. And I saw something recently that there was they were looking into it. Uh, right now, the thinking is still, and I, I would definitely agree with this, that it is a uh, weather-related issue. And so whether it was the, the freeze that we had that was so severe, the freeze that we had that caught everything early, which is one that a year ago that killed mm -hmm. all our crepe myrtles back to the ground or a bunch of them, or and or, I should say, the drought, the excessive drought that we've had more than once in the last three years, uh, that something stressed them to the point where they, the systems collapsed and they just died. Now, why does one live and the next one next to it die? That is just how nature is. I, you know, it's kind of like you and someone else both go to a party, shake the same hands, talk to the same people, and you come home and you picked up the flu and somebody else didn't. It it just is the way things can happen with plants. I see that, you know, with oak trees dying in the lawn, post oaks, one lives, the others don't. It just, they're organisms, they're living things, and when they get weak, they are open to issues. The fact that this juniper die-off has been widespread but spotty, you know, two trees next to each other, even spotty. Mm -hmm. uh, it it kind of points to there being something other than, well, now there's a soil disease killing them, or there's this insect killing them, or you see what I'm saying? Uh, the symptoms mm -hmm. don't, don't show up as needle blights, uh, which we do have fungal needle blights of junipers and other things. Uh, it just shows up as the whole tree system collapses and turns brown, or I should say bronze. It's kind of a bronzy brown. <laughs> Yeah, I was just wondering if it was some kind of fung, you know, opportunistic fungus that yeah. was taking advantage of this severe weather, and right. I didn't know whether there had been any testing for that. Well, that's a good question, and like I said, uh, the the folks at the lab are looking into it, uh, Dr. Ong's team, okay. uh, but so far I have not heard anything associated. That's a that is a good question though, because you know, it it with uh, oaks and hypoxylin. Uh, you may have two mm -hmm. oaks and one dies and the other one doesn't. The one that died had hypoxylin, but the hypoxylin moved in because it was weak. So I think ultimately it's all going to point back somehow to the weather events, whether it ended up being right. a weakened plant that then gets sick or whatever. Uh, but so far I don't know of any disease that's been associated with it. Okay, well, you know, I've lived in this area for at least 50 years, and I have never seen it so pervasive and yes. of course these junipers are really tough trees yes so they are very tough it's mm -hmm. yeah surprising very surprising okay yeah. while we're talking well, about it I'll just, I'll just say anybody from the lab that might be listening that has any information including like yeah we are looking into it or anything that's been found so far i'd appreciate you calling in uh and thank you very much colleen i appreciate that call uh, oh you're welcome thank you, you. yeah you bet uh so that that's going to be interesting Boy, nature is so that way. It is weird. Uh, I I can remember, well, I used to live down in the Houston area, and there is a an insect called sod webworm. And to my knowledge, we don't deal with it here. I'm sure it has occurred here sometime, but it's not like an issue each year we might look for. But sod webworm, you can go years and just essentially not have any of it. And then all of a sudden, there'll be a year and, and this happened to me up in the Cypress area where entire yards were just de defoliated by the sod webworm. Uh, and so what's the difference? Well, we, there's, there is a reason. Some entomologists can probably tell us, you know, it's, it's degree days or it's the lack of the winter or it's the presence of winter or who knows what happened. But it, it's just, I, I love to throw my hands up and use the term the vicissitudes of nature because that just explains everything. <laughs> without explaining anything. But yeah, this is the deeds of nature. Uh, that happens. And uh, yes, this has been rather unprecedented, but I'll bet you if you go back in time, it's not unprecedented at all. I bet this has happened from time to time. We just maybe weren't living here and noticing it and, and whatnot. But all of it really points to something I guess we'll just kind of end the show talking about today. And that is that keep your plants healthy in order to avoid problems. Sometimes that concept is oversold, especially uh, within organic discussions, organic gardening discussions. Well, if you, if you keep your plant healthy, it, you won't get pests and diseases. 
there is a partial truth in that, but it's very important to point out that it is partial. Uh, if you weaken your plant, you are inviting problems. But if you have the healthiest plant in the world, that doesn't mean that something's not going to come along and chew on the leaves or, you know, a, a fungal spore or a bacterial uh, organism isn't going to land on the leaf and call it, cause an infection. Uh, it, it just means we reduce the problems. So uh, don't over apply it, but definitely apply it. If you will do everything you can to create the ideal environment for your plants at, to, the, to where it's within your control, you will, you will do well. For example, roses. You take a bunch of roses that, that uh, are planted. Number one, did you choose disease resistance? And there are many options, including all the earth kind roses that you can find on the Aggie Horticulture website. So choosing plants that don't get sick, well, that's a good start. Uh, secondly, did you crowd them all together where there's not good air circulation? That invites disease. That's a principle of plant pathology. Did you turn on a sprinkler that's spraying the bushes every other day because you're overrunning your sprinklers? That invites diseases and problems. Do you see how all of these things, we add them together, and we either have a constantly defoliated uh, rose bush patch, patch is the right word, uh, or we have one that, that's doing quite well with the little to no problems. So we dispose them. One of the biggest things we do is prepare the soil or not. Uh, soil is where plants live and thrive. It is the foundation for success. It is absolutely what you need to do first before you plant anything. If you're going to plant a, a plant that isn't from here in this soil, this location, uh, amendments are definitely going to be an important thing. Even things from here benefit from being amended properly. When you do that, the root system holds moisture, the soil does, but it drains. That's very important in places where it rains a lot and where you get uh, heavy clay soils often. Well. Preparing the soil, raised beds, increasing organic matter, doing those sort of things, making sure all the nutrients are present in the soil bank account in adequate supplies and ratios in order to support good plant growth. You do all of those things right, and you'll have success. But don't overdo them. Lawns, for example, excessive nitrogen causes the plant to be more top growth and less rooting development, and that's a problem too. See what we mean? Everything in moderation. All right, well, there's advice. I guess we ended with probably what your grandma told you when you're growing up, but it applies to plants as well. You're listening to Garden Success. We'll be back next Thursday from 12 to 1. Uh, we look forward to visiting with you again then. You've been listening to Garden Success with retired Texas A&M AgriLife Extension horticulturist Skip Richter. Join us again next week as Skip discusses your questions about gardening and landscaping in the Brazos Valley.